This is Night by Ellie Weasel, pages 63 through 70. The summer was coming to an end. The Jewish year was nearly over. On the eve of Rosh Hashanah, the last day of the accursed year, the whole camp was electric with the tension which was all in our hearts. In the spite of everything, this day was different from any other. The last day of the year, the, wor the word last, rang very strangely. What if it were, indeed, the last day? They gave us our evening meal, a very thick soup, but no one touched it. We wanted to wait until after prayers. At the place of the assembly, surrounded by the electrifi electrified barbed wire, thousands of silent Jews gathered, their faces stricken. The night was falling. Other prisoners continued to crowd in. From every block, able suddenly to conquer time and space and submit both to their will. What are you, my God? I thought angrily, com compared to this afflicted crowd, proclaiming to you their faith, their anger, their revolt. What does your greatness mean? Lord of the universe, in face of all this weakness, this decomposition, this decay, why do you still trouble their sick minds, their crippled bodies? Ten thousand men have come to attend the solemn service, heads of the blocks, Kapos, Kapos, functionaries of death, bless the eternal. The voice of the officiant had just made itself heard. I thought at first it was the wind. Blessed be the, best be the name of the eternal. Thousands of voices repeated the benediction. Thousands of men prostrated themselves like trees before a tempest. Blessed be the name of the eternal. Why, but why should I bless him? In every fiber I rebelled, because he had had thousands of children burned in his pits, because he kept six crematories working night and day on Sundays and feast days, because Buna and so many factories of death, because in his great mind he had created Auschwitz, Birkenau, Buna, and so many factories of death. How could I say to him, Blessed art thou, eternal? master of the universe who chose from who chose us from among the races to be tortured day and night to see our fathers our mothers our brothers end in the crematory praised be thy holy name thou who hast chosen us to be butchered on thy altar i heard the voice of the officiant rising up powerful yet at the same time broken amid the tears, sobs, the sighs of the whole congregation. All the earth and the universe are gods. He kept stopping every moment, as though he did not have the strength to find the meaning beneath the words. The melody choked in his throat. And I, mystic that I had been, I thought, yes, man is very strong, greater than God. When you were deceived by Adam and Eve, you drove them out of paradise. When Noah's generation displeased you, you brought down the flood. When Sodom when Sodom no longer found favor in your eyes, you made the sky rain down fire and sulfur. But these men here, whom you have betrayed, whom you have allowed to be tortured, butchered, gassed, burned, what do they do? They pray before you. They praise your name. All creation bears witness to the greatness of God. Once New Year's Day had dominated my life, I knew that my sins grieved the Eternal. I implored his forgiveness. Once I had believed profoundly that upon one solidary deed of mine, one solidary prayer, depended the salvation of the world. This day I had ceased to plead. I was no longer capable of lament lamentation. On the contrary, I felt very strong. I was the accuser. God, God the accused. My eyes were open and I was alone, terribly alone. In a world without God and without man, without love or mercy, I had ceased to be anything but ashes. I yet, yet, I felt myself to be stronger than, than the Almighty, to whom my life had been tied for so long. I stood amid the praying congregation, observing it like a stranger. The service ended with Kaddish. Everyone recited the Kaddish over his parents, over his children, over his brothers, and over himself. We stayed for a long time at the assembly place. No one dared to drag himself away from this mirage. 
Then it was time to go to bed, and slowly the prisoners made their way over to their blocks. I heard people wishing one another Happy New Year. I ran off to look for my father, and at the same time I was afraid of having to wish him a Happy New Year when I no longer believed in it. He was standing near the wall, bowed down, his shoulders sagging as though beneath a heavy burden. I went up to him, took his hand, and kissed it. A tear fell upon it. Whose was that tear? Mine. His? I said nothing, nor did he. We had never understood one another so clearly. The sound of the bell jolted us back to reality. We must go to bed. We came back from far away. I raised my eyes to look at my father's face, leaning over mine, to try to discover a smile or something resembling one upon the aged, dried-up countenance. Nothing, not the shadow of an expression, beaten. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Should we fast? The question was hotly debated. To fast would mean a sure, swifter death. We fasted here the whole year round. The whole year was Yom Kippur. But others said that we should fast simply because it was, because it was dangerous to do so. We should show God that even here in his enclosed hell, we are capable of singing his praises. I did not fast mainly to please my father, who had forbidden me to do so. But further, there was no longer any reason why I should fast. I no longer accepted God's silence. As I swallowed my bowl of soup, I saw in the gesture of an act of rebellion and protest against him. I nibbled, and I nibbled my crust of bread. In the depths of my heart, I felt a greed void. The SS gave us a fine New Year's gift. We had just come back from work. As soon as we had passed through the door of the camp, we sensed something different in the air. Roll call did not take so long as usual. The evening soup was given out with great speed and swallowed down at once in anguish. I was no longer in the same block as my father. I had been transferred to another unit, the building one, where 12 hours a day I had to drag heavy blocks of stone about. The head of my new block was a German Jew, small of stature, with piercing eyes. He told us that evening... He told us that evening that no one would be allowed to go out after the evening soup, and soon a terrible word was circulating, selection. We knew that what that meant. An SS man would examine us whenever he found a weak one. A muzzleman, as we called them, would write his number down, good for the crematory. After soup, we gathered together between the beds. The veterans said, You're lucky to have been brought here so late. This camp is paradise today, compared with what it was like two years ago, Buna is a real hell then. There was no water, no blankets, less soup and bread. At night we slept almost naked and it was below 30 degrees. The corpses were collected in hundreds every day. The work was hard. Today, this is a little paradise. The Kapos had orders to kill a certain number of prisoners every day, every week. Selection. A merciless selection. Yes, you're lucky. Stop it. Be quiet, I begged. You can tell your stories tomorrow or on some other day. They burst out laughing. They were not veterans for nothing. Are you scared? So were, so were we scared. So were we scared. And there was plenty to be scared of in those days. The old men stayed in their corner, dumb, motionless, haunted. Some were praying. An hour's delay. In an hour we should know the verdict, death or reprieve. And my father, suddenly I remembered him. How would he pass the selection? He aged so much. The head of our block had never been outside concentration camps since 1933. He had already been through all the slaughterhouses, all the factories of death. At about 9 o'clock, he took up his position in our midst. Achtung! There was an instant silence. Listen carefully to me to what I'm going to say. For the first time, I heard his voice quiver. In a few moments, the selection will begin. He must... You must get completely undressed. Then one by one you go before the SS doctors. I hope you I hope you will all succeed in getting through, but you must help your own chances. Before you go into the next room, move about in, in some way that you give yourselves a little color. Don't walk slowly. Run. Run as if the devil were after you. Don't look at the SS. Run. Straight in front of you. He broke off for a moment and added, And the essential thing, don't be afraid. He was a piece of... Here was a piece of advice we should have liked very much able to be, be able to follow. 
I got undressed, leaving my clothes on the bed. There was no danger of anyone stealing them this evening. Tibby and Yoshi, Yossi, who had changed their unit at the same time as I had, came up to me and said, Let's keep together. We shall be stronger. Yossi was murmuring something between his teeth. He must have been praying. I never had realized that Yossi was a believer. I had even, all, I had, I had even always thought the, re the reverse. Tibby was silent, very pale. All the prisoners in the block stood naked between the beds. This must be how one stands at the Last Judgment. They were coming. There were three SS officers standing round the notorious Dr. Mingale, who had received us at Birkenau. The head of the block, with an attempt at a smile, asked us, Ready? Yes, we were ready. So the SS doctors, Dr. Mingale, was holding a list in our hand, our numbers. He made a sign to the head of the block. We can begin, as if this were a game. The first to go were by the officials of the block. Stubant, Dinse, Kapos, Foreman. All in perfect physical condition, of course. Then came the ordinary prisoner's turn. Dr. Mingale took stock of them from head to foot. Every now and then he wrote down a number. One single thought filled my mind, not to let my number be taken, not to show my left arm. There were only Tibby and Yossi in front of me. They passed. I had time to notice that Mingale had not written their numbers down. Someone pushed me. It was my turn. I ran without looking back. My head was spinning. You're too thin. You're weak. You're too thin. You're good for your furnace. For the furnace. The race seemed interminable. I thought I had been running for years. You're too thin. You're too weak. At last I arrived exhausted. When I regained my breath, I questioned Yossi and Tibby. Was I written down? No, said Yossi. He added, smiling. In any case, he couldn't have written you down. You were running too fast. I began to laugh. I was glad. I would have liked to kiss him. <laughs> At that moment, what did the others? What did the other matter? I hadn't been written down. Those were the, those whose numbers had been noted to the part, abandoned by the whole world. Some were weeping in silence. The SS officers went away. The head of the block appeared, his face reflecting the general weariness. Everything went off all right. Don't worry, nothing is going to happen to anyone. To anyone. Again, he tried to smile. A poor, in, emancipate, emancipated, dried up Jew questioned him avidly in a trembling voice. But, but, block a tense. They did, they did write me down. The head of the block let his anger break out. What? Did someone refuse to believe him? What's the matter now? Am, am I telling lies then? I tell you once and for all, nothing's going to happen to you. To anyone, you're wallowing in your own despair, you fool. The bell rang, a signal that selection had been completed throughout the camp. With all my might, I began to run to Block 36. I met my father on the way. He came to me. Well, so you passed? Yes. And you? Me too. How we breathed again. Now, my father had brought me a present, half a ration of bread, obtained in exchange for a piece of rubber found at the warehouse, which would do to a sole shoe. The bell, already. We must separate. Go to bed. Everything was regulated by the bell. It gave me orders. I automatically obeyed them. I hated it. Whenever I dreamed of a better world, I could only imagine a universe with no bells. So like several days had elapsed, we no longer thought about the selection. We went to work as usual, loading heavy stones into railway wagons. The rations had become more, more meager. This was the only change. We had risen before dawn, as on every day. We had received the black coffee, the ration of bread. We were about to set out for the yard as usual. The head of the block arrived, running. Silence for a moment. I have a list of numbers here. I'm going to read them to you. Whose numbers I call won't be going to work this morning. You'll stay behind in the camp. And in a soft voice, he read out about ten numbers. We had understood that those these were the numbers chosen at the selection. Dr. Mingale had not forgotten. The head of the block went toward his room. Ten prisoners surrounded him, hanging on to his clothes. Save us. You promised. We want to go to the yard. We're strong enough to work. We're good workers. We can. We will. He tried to calm them, to reassure them about their fate, to explain to them that the fact that they were staying behind in camp did not mean much, had no tragic significance. After all, I stay here myself every day, he added. It was a somewhat feeble argument. He realized it, and without another word, went and shut himself up in his room. The bell had just rung. Form up. It scarcely mattered. Now that the work was hard, the essential thing was to be far away as possible from the block, 
from the crucible of death, from the center of hell. 